So um, I don't have any particular announcements today. Let's move forward. Uh, I guess the one announcement I do have your graded homework twos here and some leftover ones if you haven't picked them up. So here, get them at the end of class. All right. So um, we have been talking about this problem of so-called face-based representations and we're getting into this issue of what we call quasi-probability distributions. Okay? Very, very fundamental idea in quantum mechanics, really. Um, so, uh, in this context of thinking about a mode of an electromagnetic field, which is equivalent to thinking about weight mechanics in 1D, um, we, uh, we're looking at these different representations in terms of what are called operator-ordered products. So we uh, assume there existed some way of writing whatever operator on the, acting on the mode in terms of uh, a power series um, in operator order products of A and A dagger for normal order, symmetric order, or anti-normal order. And thus, in this the notation that I'm using here, the sigma ordered power series is then defines that representation. Okay. And what we found after some amount of algebraic manipulation is that we can obtain this function through this inner product between the operator A and this operator T with the other ordering. Okay, minus sigma. And this operator T is a delta function which sets A dagger to alpha star and A to alpha, as we do in a specific order of operator ordering. So it's a kind of formal expression, and we can obtain it as the Fourier transform on phase space of the plane wave operators, which are the displacement operators for that operator order. Okay? So the what we have is a general expression for this case that we can think about sigma as some real number between minus 1 and plus 1. We're at the moment only looking at the three cases, minus 1, 0, and plus 1. But it's a formal expression. We can think about it as a continuum of orderings. Okay. Ben brought this up to me at the end of the lecture. I said, is that Useful in a conjecture? Yes, I'll, I'll give you an example of where we might actually think about a continuum of orderings uh, from a formal state or point of view and what that actually could be useful for. But, you know, the specific orderings for symmetric ordering, sigma zero, that's the usual displacement operator. The normally ordered cases, as we see here, with all the A daggers on the left and all the A's on the right. And the anti-normally ordered case is has all the A's on the left and all the A daggers on the right. Okay? And so these operators T are these Fourier transforms, which are either written here in symmetric order. It doesn't have because this is in the exponent, I can't tell, I can switch the order of A and A dagger, it doesn't make a difference. This is my normally ordered delta function, right? So this would be pi delta 
function with the A daggers on the left and the A's on the right, right? Because I could take these two Fourier transforms independently. And then similarly, the antinomally ordered guy has the A on the left and the A dagger on the right. Okay? And it's sometimes it will come back because it's useful to think about this in terms of the real and imaginary, the quadratures here. This symmetric delta function is sometimes known as the vial operator, because Herman Vial first wrote these kinds of things down uh, in terms of using operator orderings on phase space. And you can see this here is a symmetric delta function, which sets the operator x to the number x and the operator p to the number p. <coughs> when you take that Fourier transform. Okay. Very good. Now, oh, I, I, I failed to just emphasize one small point here, which is that these operators here are Hermitian. The delta functions are Hermitian. The plane wave, the Ds are not Hermitian, right? But the delta functions are. In the same way that a plane wave, or you know, e to the ikx, is not a real number, but the Fourier transform of it is, right? So, so you can take the dagger of this, you can check that it's equal. Okay? All right. Um, so that's why when we did this trace, I didn't have a dagger on that. Otherwise, I, you might have thought I needed it. Um, all right. So, um, the delta functions, like the plane waves, form a complete operator basis, and I can write any operator then as a So this, as we expressed before, can be seen as I project A onto this operator, and then that coefficient tells me how much of that operator I need to sum up to get the total operator. But again, notice they come in this dual form, right? The, the different orderings, okay? So, um, I might, what we are interested in often is something like the expected value of this observable. It doesn't have to be an observable, but it could be whatever operator it is, as the trace of A with rho. Okay. And that is plugging that in is equal to this duality, this guy is the minus sigma ordered representation in phase space of the operator A. And this object is the uh, 
plus sigma ordered representation of the state rho. Right? Because it goes in this duality. If you want the sigma ordered here, you gotta trace with the minus sky. Alright? So this object we call the representation of the state, we throw in that pi for, its, for a reason so that this is normalized. We'll see that in a moment. So the W sigma of alpha is 1 over pi, the sigma order representation of rho is what we call the sigma ordered representation or phase space representation. when sigma is 0, we call this w, and that is the Wigner function. When we're looking at normally ordered uh, representation of rho, we call that q, which is, you know, is was originally wrote, written down in 1940, by Husini is called the Husini function. And when we look at the anti-normally ordered representation of rho, we call that P. That's our old friend, the Glauber Sudarshan representation. Okay. So these three <coughs> different representations that were written down in three different contexts over the decades of the 1900s, also known as the 20th century, um, are just different ordered representations of the same state. Okay? And again, we notice here this duality, right? So. Um, if I look at an operator and I look at its expectation value, I can look at that expectation value as an average over the Wigner function with the symmetrically ordered representation of A. Or equivalently, it is the average over the Q function with the anti-normally ordered representation of A. Or equivalently, it is the average over the P representation with the normally ordered representation of A. All three of those things have to be equal. Okay? Um, this, of course, we'll come back to this, is something that's where, what we explored last semester and into the beginning of this semester when we thought about the Glauber correlation functions, which had to do with normally ordered operators. And it was, the, it was in that context that the P representation was the natural thing to consider. We'll come back to that and see that again in a moment. Okay. Um, I guess there's one little thing that I wanted to say here. One of the things you're proving in your homework, this current set, is that this operator has actually a simple form. It can be expressed in terms of be equal to a projector onto a coherent state at that value alpha. Amazing but true. You can't maybe obviously see it, but it is. You know, if you haven't worked it out, you will. Or get zero for the homework. Uh, so, um, 
you know, in that case, we see uh, well, the um, representation. If I looked at, for example, let's write row here. Okay, and let's put plus one and minus one. This is P alpha, right? It's the antinomially ordered <coughs> row with the pi in there, which is what we just said over here. And this is that, which is what we said before, right? This is how we express the P representation, we say the P representation can be thought about as writing the state rho as a statistical mixture of pure coherent states. Now, this will only be a statistical mixture of coherent states if this is an honest to God probability distribution. And that is not guaranteed. The class of states for which that was true were what we call classical light. Okay. But as we are seeing here, that notion of classical light depends on what, when I was thinking about <coughs> normally ordered <coughs> observables. Right. So each one of these representations is useful in different contexts. What is true is that if I want to calculate the average value of some sigma ordered product of A's and A daggers, then this can be written as an average over the opposite sign of the quasi-probability distribution. That's to say, for this order, I need the minus sigma ordered version of rho, alpha star to the n, alpha to the m. Right? So for an example, the normally ordered would be, I take the anti-normally ordered version of the state. about photon counting, it was these normally ordered products that appeared. And then that average we thought about as a statistical average over a distribution of um, amplitudes of the light, complex amplitudes, with the classical operator turned into a C number over here. Right. Okay. So, let's see. Um, let me just, let's say a few things about the properties. <coughs> functions. Well, firstly, they are real. You 
these are real numbers. How do we see that? Well, this guy is equal to the integral. Let's see how I want to say it. So, um, if I take the complex conjugate of this thing, because these guys are both permission, I get the same thing. In fact, for any permission operator, this representation is real. It's also normalized over phase space. So that factor of pi is written there such that if I integrate this thing over phase space, I get, oops, no pi there. Pardon me. Integrated over phase space, I get one. Okay. If I wanted to write this in terms of the real and imaginary parts, it would look like this. So we usually put that factor of two in here and define the bigger function as a function of the quadratures as a half. That factor of two floats around sometimes so that I don't have to, if I could think about this as a function of that complex number, I want to put that factor of two in here so, it's, so that it's normalized over integral over x and p, okay? This is how we define it. Okay, so this is a function over the two-dimensional phase space, which is both real and normalized over the phase space. So in that sense, it looks like a probability distribution, right? If I thought about a probability distribution over phase space, it would be some real function as a function of that which we could normalize in some way, and we've chosen it to be so. However, it's not a probability distribution. It's what we call a quasi-probability distribution. It is quasi because this can be negative. In fact, we'll, have, we'll come back to the whole question about whether or not this function even is a good function, exists in some way, isn't horribly singular. We have waved our hands completely to just assume that this power series over here converged and there is no reason to know at this stage whether that is a convergent power series or not. We can't completely ignore that much as a, as a physicist I want to. Um, That's why we call it quasi? No. We call it quasi because it can be negative. Probabilities can't be negative. So. We can, if we look at, for example, at least let's come back to this more. If we look at these expressions for the mean value, we can think about them as an average of this quantity over a quasi probability distribution. It looks like classical mechanics 
Liadillian classical statistical mechanics, if you like, averaging whatever this uh, observable is on phase space over a distribution function. But in some cases, this is not an honest to God probability distribution. It can have negative values. And that is a smoking gun this, we have different non-classical features. Right? We have the fact that we have incompatible observables. X and P don't commute. Well, what does that mean? What does that imply? Well, there's different ways we see the implications of that fact. Mm -hmm. If I look, for example, at the state of the system, I can write a representation of that state in position space, should I so choose. Right? I could write this thing as an integral over x rho x x prime x x prime where rho x x prime is the element of the density matrix, right? That's a perfectly good representation of the state. Or I can write the state similarly in momentum space. But we're typically taught we have to choose one representation or the other. We could think about position space probability amplitudes or momentum space probability amplitudes. We can think about the probability density which for a pure state is the square of the wave function. We could think about the momentum space wave function, and we can think about the probability distribution in momentum space. Right? So this is the momentum space probability distribution. This is the position space probability distribution, but we're typically taught because x and p don't commute, we can't write a joint probability distribution on both position and momentum because they don't commute. But we kind of can. Instead, what we have now is a joint distribution on both X and P like this. And this is a joint 
distribution. on phase space. Now, of course, there's something in each of these representations that distinguishes this from just a classical statistical distribution. Of course, here, we're talking about complex probability amplitudes. These are not probabilities, generally. These are probability amplitudes. Yeah, Cody. Um, on that last line, yeah. does that mean integral over x and p? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, indeed. Yes, thanks for pointing that out. So these guys were probability amplitudes, and we have, we have always talked about and thought about non-classicality in terms of quantum interference, right? And to get the final probability of the outcome, we have to think about adding up the probability amplitudes for all indistinguishable histories that led to the final outcome, and then squaring that amplitude, and then we would get interference terms that would add or could be constructive or destructive and change the probabilities in a way that was non-classical, right? So we thought about this from the point of view of quantum interference. But there's a different picture here which is maybe instead of thinking about interference, I think about a new theory of probability that has negative probabilities, possibly. And that will give us all the same kinds of predictions we see for the final outcome. I have to add them up, but sometimes I have negative probabilities. So this, is, I think, is a fascinating point. So the first question is, what the heck do negative probabilities mean? Any, anybody have any thoughts about that? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, it means that an event that could happen, we weight negatively. We kind of take it away more. It means something that could have happened <clears throat> gets subtracted away in some way. Is that, this is something that I find fascinating, and when I retire, which the way I'm feeling these days might be not too far in the future, um, I really think this is, there's something deep here. It's not just a mathematical coincidence of sorts. It's telling us something. And here's, okay, so this will be on the web forever. Here's my totally crazy idea about the foundation of the quantum mechanics. You ready? So, um, why is quantum, what's wrong with quantum mechanics? In my opinion, what's wrong with quantum mechanics is that there are effects that have no causes. You say, fine, that's just the way life is. Live with it. There is sometimes there are effects that have no causes. I'd be fine with that if you let me know when that's true. At yeah, what point does, is there something that's an, an effect that has no cause? We put that in by hand by saying the measurement, but what's a measurement, right? So we haven't, we haven't solved that problem. Um, so, what if instead there were um, causes that uh, led to the effects, but we didn't have access to those causes? Those are called hidden variables. And they, if we had, if there were hidden variables that we don't have access to, uh, then 
um, that would give us randomness. But we know, as we will see and remind ourselves a little bit, that uh, if there are hidden variables, they cannot be local hidden variables. They cannot be causally connected in Einstein causality. But what if the hidden variables were coming from the future to the present? From our perspective, it would appear random because we have no access to that. They're causally unconnected to us. And what if those, so you remember, of course, Feynman thought about particles going backwards in time as antiparticles. So what if the effects that are leading to the causes are annihilating possibilities of things happen and causing negative probabilities? So if they annihilated, this is totally crazy. It's on the web forever. But this is my thought of how to resolve quantum mechanics, that negative probabilities are the whole story. And if we can understand where negative probabilities come from, we can understand the foundations of quantum mechanics. And it's all the future of thinking the present. All right, so what the heck? Let's continue. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about some of the properties of these quasi-probability distributions. And I'm just going to start with the case of the bigger problems. This is a simplification of the expression that we saw in terms of the displacement operators. So I look at the Fourier transform of these octagonal elements. pure state. So that was the, this expression is the one that Victor originally wrote down. For an arbitrary mixed state, it has this form, and it follows as it, you can show that, as you will in your homework, that this is equal using the displacement operator. You see it involves displacements in two different directions, it involves this octagonal element. Now, why did Victor write it down this way? Well, Wigner was looking for some kind of joint distribution. I mean, first of all, you see that this is real. Take the complex conjugate of it. I get back the same thing when I just change y to minus y. 
um, in the integral. So it's a real function. It's also normalized. If I integrate uh, this over x and p, you'll see that this is equal to 1. But Wigner wrote down this distribution because it has the following property. If I look at the marginals, so the marginals of the distribution are integrating out one of the variables. Let's say I integrate out p. What would you like this to be if you were Wigner? No, I'm not averaging over p. That would, if I wrote a p there, you'd be correct. Then it would be the average p. This is what's called the marginal of a joint distribution. Okay. So let me remind you. Uh, if I had a distribution p of, so this is a joint probability distribution on two variables, x1 and x2. And if I integrate over x2, what should this be? It's the probability of x1. Okay? That's the margin. Okay? So this is marginalizing the joint quasi-probability distribution. In this case, this would be the probability density over x, which is equal to what? It's rho xx. It's the diagonal element or the square of the wave function for a pure state. Right? So you would like that when you marginalize this over p, you get the square of the wave function in x. And similarly, if you marginalize this <coughs> over x, you would like this to be the momentum space wave function, or the marginal So Wigner constructed this object which had this property. Okay? In fact, this object <coughs> has the marginals that are correct with respect to any quadrature. So if I thought about phase space, and I think about two quadratures, right? That's some for some phase quadrature. And I integrate over the conjugate, I get the probability distribution with respect to that quadrature. So it has all the right marginals with respect to phase space. So in that sense, it gives the right probability distribution that I would get if I measured in x, I would say this is the probability distribution I should get in x. That's what quantum mechanics tells us. If I measure p, the square of the momentum space wave function tells me the probability density in p. And if I wanted to say something about the joint probability distribution to assign a value of both x and p at the same time, I would assign this value, w. okay? And this is the natural thing to do when I'm measuring the quadratures. So if, I'm me if my observable is the quadratures, if I'm doing a Hohenbaum measurement, I want to use the Wigner function to describe that. Okay? Now, let's take a look. Let's, uh, Turn on the projector here and look at some examples of figure functions. Wakey, wakey. Let's see, HDMI. 
Yay. OK. So this is the home page from our class website. And this is a figure that I stole from this very nice paper from Philippe Grandier's group, where they were looking at continuous variable quantum optics. Okay. And what's being plotted here are the um, Wigner functions for different states of the harmonic oscillator or the mode. Okay. This, uh, this thing is the Wigner function for a coherent state. It has a Gaussian distribution, as we will calculate in a moment, in phase space, a joint Gaussian. Its marginals are Gaussians because, of course, what it is is a displaced vacuum. And the vacuum state, as you know, is a Gaussian wave function in both position and momentum, right? And when you square it, you get a Gaussian. This is the joint probability distribution of that sort. What is this object? That's a squeeze state, it's a squeeze coherent state in this case, because it has a mean value. It's squeezed along P. Notice that these functions are everywhere positive. And it's as we discuss, and when we motivated this from the beginning in thinking about squeezing, we can think about squeeze states as completely classical from the point of view of homodyne detection. I just don't understand on that image how the shadow is a lot shorter on the left side. Yeah. It's not really the shadow. Of course, it has to be renormalized, right? You have to integrate, okay. right? So you have to integrate <laughs> over, over um, either, in this case, Q or P, and then it will be properly normalized. So it's the integral that gives you that shorter. Um, what is this object? Well, let's think about what this is. Firstly, this object, let's, let's, for that, heck, because it's a little bit confusing, let's take the origin here, okay? Right in the middle, even though it's not the way it's shown. So let's take the origin right here. <coughs> this object is rotationally invariant, right? That if I took the axis, the origin right there. It's rotationally symmetric in phase space, which means it's invariant under the transformation by the rotation operator in phase space, which is the number operator. So what kind of state is invariant under rotations. A Fox, a Fox state, right? This is a Fox state. It's a state that has, in some sense, a definite energy, right? Because you remember, x squared plus p squared is the energy. These are the energy eigenstates. This particular state is which Fox state? Well, we can see that by looking at the marginals. The marginals are the squares of the wave functions. So this is the position space wave function, and this is the momentum space wave function squared, right? Because it's the marginal is the probability distribution. So which Fox state is this? N equals 1. Why do you say that? That is absolutely correct. Because it has one node, right? And you know that the first excited state of the harmonica of any, if you have a wave mechanics, you have one node and you square. Now, if you're going to have something which is rotationally symmetric in phase space and has a node in the marginals, the only way that could be true is if it has negative values. Otherwise, there's no way when I integrate this, it will have a zero because you have to subtract negative probabilities 
from positive probabilities in order to get zero once you do that integral. So this state is very non-classical <coughs> from the point of view of homodyne detection. What about this state? Well, let's look at the marginals. The position space marginal is two lumps, right? The particle has a probability of being here, and it has a probability of being here, OK? What is the momentum space wave function? Well, it has these fringes, lots of fringes. So what state is that? What kind of, just thinking about wave functions and your first quantum mechanics course you probably had, maybe second or third, I don't know. Um, what kind of state has, in position, the particle is either here or here, but in momentum space, it has interference fringes. It's the covariant superposition of those two states? Exactly. Thank you, Vikas. It's just a, it's a superposition of these two wave packets. If I looked at something which is a superposition, of a wave packet here and a wave packet there, which are sufficiently separated, in position space, the probability distribution is going to be, it either went through this slit or that. But in momentum space, I would see interference fringes, which is the momentum space wave function, what you see you know, in the far field of the double slit. So this is like sending the particle through a double slit. And what we see in the Wigner function is, well, the particle is localized. In this case, if we call this the origin, it has zero momentum with a little spread momentum relative to the size of the slit. But the fact that it's a superposition of this and this along x leads to these negative values of the Wigner function, which it must be, because when I project that, I need all these nodes. And the farther away it is in x, the bigger the slits are, the faster these oscillations would be, right? Because there's the Fourier duality uh, uh, of that. This state <coughs> is we love to call in quantum optics, because who doesn't love calling things a cat state? This is what we sometimes call a Schrodinger cat state. If we think about this as the particle is macroscopically distinguishable, okay? And it has these highly non-classical features in the Wigner function. People talk about cat states all the time. Excellent. Come back to this in a bit. Related to the normally ordered product, and the normally ordered product I get by tracing with the minus one version, because it's always this duality. Okay. And this we said <coughs> was equal to that. Right? Because I we said that the t minus one guy happen to be the projector on a coherent state, amazing but true. 
So what is this thing equal to? Exactly. It's the diagonal matrix of it, right? Which for a pure state is just a projection onto the coherent state. It's what you might have first guessed if I wanted to write down a representation in phase space, I might look at how it projects onto a coherent state since the coherent state is like an eigenstate of x and p at the same time, sort of. Right? This is what Hussini first wrote down in 1940. Now, interestingly, this thing is always positive. <coughs> right? Because it's the square of this number. And so that's an interesting fact. So you might say, can't I formulate quantum mechanics then in terms of a classical probability distribution? Because I can always do it in terms of a Poussin distribution. This looks like a perfectly honest to God probability distribution. Well, there's a subtlety. Obviously not. There's, some, there's something missing here. We'll come back to it in a moment. There's something that says I can't really do that. Even though the Husini distribution is always positive, it's not going to allow us to have a classical description of any measurement outcome. By the way, this is a particular measurement outcome. This is the Born rule associated with a particular <coughs> positive operator. So this are elements of a this, there is some measurement I could do which projects onto coherent states but come with these probabilities. It's called heterodyne, and we might see that a little bit later. All right. Now, to get a little deeper into this, we need one last piece of formalism. in the theory of distribution functions. And let's talk about then the um, idea of the characteristic function. In statistics. So if I have a, let's say I have a probability distribution on a continuous variable x. Okay. I'm going to define the characteristic function chi with respect to y as the Fourier transform of the probability distribution. That, in statistics, is known as the characteristic function. Okay. You can think about it as, the, in this case it's 1 over 2 pi, the expected value of this function of x, averaging that over the probability distribution. I can't remember whether I want that too high in there or not. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I don't want to bother with that. Let's get rid of that. Let's define it this way. All right. Now, in statistics, we define the characteristic function because this is a generating function. For example, what is the expected value of the moment x to the n? It's a moment of the distribution, right? I can obtain that 
by taking the derivative of this function with respect to y n times. And I'll bring down n values. So this is equal to i to the n, the nth derivative of the characteristic function evaluated at its origin. So if I have the characteristic function, all of its derivatives at the origin tell me about those moments. Okay? So similarly, we define characteristic functions for the quasi-probability distribution. I should say I can generalize this to multi-variable case if I have some probability distribution over some joint distribution of variables for some number of variables, I can define the characteristic function So now let us define the characteristic function associated with the Fourier transform of our joint quasi-probability distribution. So in quantum mechanics, I define chi for the sigma order as a function of beta as the Fourier transform And in the 2D Fourier transform here, it does have the pi. Of the sigma ordered representation. So this object is useful. I mean, and if I take the Fourier transform, this is nothing more than the trace of rho with the displacement alpha here in the opposite order. Because remember that the Wigner function was the trace with the delta function. When I take the Fourier transform, I get the plane wave. Right? So this is just the expected value of the displacement operator for that, at that value of beta, for that minus sigma ordering. This is the quantum mechanical generalization of this. Right? Average it. So that's what we call the characteristic function. And I can use the characteristic function to calculate moments in the same way. If I take partial derivatives of the characteristic function, I can take, uh, I can find moments. But it's also useful, as we will see, for trying to prove aspects of existence and the properties of these quasi-probability distributions. In particular, the Wigner function itself, well, not the Wigner function, but the, I'm going to have to switch to green because this thing is dead at this point. Uh, maybe it was, oh no, there's the better one, it's over here. Maybe you want me to switch to green anyway, I don't know. The Wigner function, or the, or the W function for that, is the inverse Fourier transform. Of the characteristic function. 
So here's one way as you might see in homework how you would calculate a characteristic, I mean the, these distributions. You can calculate this average often. That gives you the characteristic function and then you take its inverse Fourier transform and that gives you that. That's a recipe that's often useful. Okay. All right, but now let's turn our attention uh, So I want to ask whether or not these power series converge or not, and from that, uh, get some notions. So um, let's see. Um, so we want to see whether these power series converge. To, to do that, I'm going to look at the question of what are called, um, so we want to know whether these functions are good functions or not, okay? So, um, the characteristic function exists if this function is square normalizable. And vice versa. This is just a property of Fourier transforms. normalizable function on phase space, I write it, I look at it square, if this is finite, we say it's square normalizable. So let's look at these operators. We have a notion of what we call bounded operators. I'm going to define the Hilbert-Schmidt norm which is of an operator as the inner product of the operator with itself according to the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product. But using our phase space representations this can be expressed as that. How would you see that expression, this equality? Anybody have any thoughts about how I can show this equals this? I mean, I, I, I can use the representation of A in terms of a quasi-probability or an operator ordered product, substitute it in, and I'll get the A dagger, and I'll get this expression. Okay. So for example, for a for sigma equals zero, this is equal to this. I'm sorry. 
So if it's a bounded operator, we say that this is less than infinity. And if it's a bounded operator, then, well, we can write its operator ordered product. Because I can define the characteristic function, I can Fourier transform it, everything is fine. So what's important is that this object, as long as this is less than infinity, then I can write down the Wigner function for it. So, what about the density operator? Can I write down a Wigner function for any density operator? Does that always exist? Yes. Is the density operator a bounded operator? Well, the density operator is Hermitian, so that's the trace of rho squared. But what's that? That's always less than or equal to 1. So this is a bounded operator. Which means that the Wigner function is a good representation. any quantum state, we can always write down a well-behaved Wigner function because rho is a valid operator and therefore its square norm is less infinity. That's a perfectly good, that will always converge. But what about the others? Well, function. Let's look at the Q function is the inverse Fourier transform of the <coughs> this guy is the normally ordered guy here. So Fourier transform of that. But this characteristic function, as we express somewhere over here, I obtain by taking the trace of rho with d minus 1. But d minus 1 is e to the plus beta squared over 2. Okay. Because I just made that, remember the d sigma. Oh, this guy has a minus. So, what that says is that this, of course, is the characteristic function of the bigger function. So, I ask you the following question. Is this thing square normalizable? Well, if the Wigner function is square normalizable, this thing certainly is too. Because this thing cuts off even faster. So this thing always exists. As we saw, it was just that simple thing anyway. And that's clear that that always exists. So that's fine. That's all self-consistent. But what about the p function? The p function. Is related to the anti-normally ordered guy. And 
that I have to get by tracing with the other order. So unless this thing falls off more rapidly than this, this thing is not going to be square normalizable. Which means that the peak function, there's not always a good convergent P representation for any state. For example, for a Fox state, you can't write down the peak function as any tempered distribution. It will be nth order derivatives of delta functions. It will be horribly singular. It won't be anything meaningful at all in that case. Now, this same existence is true for any observable if it's a bounded observable. For any bounded observable or any bounded operator, and it's going to give, give me three more minutes because I want to get to the one conclusion here. If I have a bounded observable or bounded operator, then this exists, this exists, but this normally ordered guy is a crappy representation. So this now is the resolution to why even though the Q function is always positive, and so you might say, hey, I've got quantum mechanics with an honest to God probability distribution. That's not the whole story. Because if I look at the expected value of A, it's that. This is the normally ordered value of rho and the anti-normally ordered representation of A. So whereas this is always positive, this might not even be a meaningful thing can't even calculate it. So the Q function always exists, but it's not always useful. In fact, in fact, in most cases, it can't be used to give me predictions because the anti-normally ordered representation is not a good representation. In contrast, the P function is such that the observable always exists. I can always write this this is always good, but this might not exist. It only exists for a subclass of states that we call classical states, like coherent states and thermal states. But for a Fox state, this would, I could not write this down. And the Goldilocks of all of them is the bigger function. This always exists and this always exists. And this is always a good representation. We can always use it. Okay. So the final thing that we'll, we'll say for our summary next time is the question about non-classicality. This is always classical in some sense, but it doesn't tell us anything because I can't necessarily write down this representation. In this case, I can write down these, but the question of whether our measurement is classical or non-classical depends on the classicality of these different functions. And that 
represent different questions of resources. When these objects are not true probability distributions, but are quasi-probability distribution, that gives, can, gives us a resource. A resource for doing something that we couldn't do with classical physics. And we'll just summarize that next time. All right. Very good. Existence. We can all ponder it. The rest of the <coughs> Have a good afternoon. Oh.